Well, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, dear friends of the Schiller Institute, I think we all have come to this conference because everybody who is in this room knows that we are experiencing an absolutely unprecedented systemic and existential crisis of civilization. You have the coincidence of a war danger where NATO is confronting Russia in a very, very uh, aggressive fashion which could lead to a third world war. You have a US confrontation against China in the South China Sea. You have the danger of a new 2008 type of financial crisis which could blow up the financial system. Uh, and naturally, uh, you had yesterday or two days ago the Brexit, Great Britain voting to leave the e European Union. And as we all know, this was not a vote against Europe as such, but it was a vote against a completely unjust system and <coughs> a corrupt elite. Now, the conference has one topic or one subsuming topic, and that is to define solutions to these crises, to discuss what would be the new paradigm and is mankind capable of solving such an ex existential crisis. Now, we have distinguished speakers from four continents, uh, from many countries, uh, and <coughs> obviously, you know, these are the people or they are representative of the kinds of people which are determined that a solution is being found. And before I go into touching upon these various mortal dangers, the solution is easy. So be at rest and be calm. If men unite for a good plan and act in solidarity with courage, any crisis in human civilization can be overcome because that is the nature of human beings that when we are challenged with a great evil that an even greater force of good is being awoken in our soul. Now, look at the situation, what happened. Great Britain voted on Thursday 52% to leave the EU. Immediately, you had an explosion in the financial markets in the morning hours of, Thursday, of Friday. Five trillion uh, pounds sterling were wiped out. It could have been a Black Friday. The turbulences continue. So some people are now in absolute dismay and say, how could we be so wrong? The bookmakers were telling us till midnight the opposite, that everything would be fine. How did we get caught on such a wrong foot? Now, I will talk about that, but let me preface it with saying that maybe this Brexit is a blessing in disguise because it is a vote against a supranational bureaucracy, a Brussels soulless dictatorship. It's a vote against robbery of national sovereignty against a completely heartless European Union Commission, which has been completely alienated from the people in Europe. A European Union which has no unity, it has no humanitarianism, and <coughs> it creates the chance to build a completely new Europe. Now, I remember at a Schiller conference in 2003, uh, this was the day the Iraq war started, I prefaced my speech by saying, are these people insane? Don't they know that by attacking a country based on lies, that they will call for the Irenaeus, those goddesses of natural law, which may not act immediately, but you know there is a higher justice which corrects things. And I find it a historical irony, so if you, if you want, that the connection between the British voting against <coughs> uh, the EU membership and the connection to the illegal war against Iraq 
Well, remember that it was the Iraq war which was one of the root causes to cause the refugee crisis. One of the root causes why, uh, you know, why Europe is in such distress and that now of all people, the British people are voting something which is the destruction of the British Empire and may lead from a Great Britain to a very tiny Britain, uh, namely if Scotland and uh, Ireland leave, I think this is a higher justice and the proof that the nemesis is a force in history. Now, let me uh, focus on the underlying danger which does not go away through this, but as I said, it creates new openings to uh, find a solution. We are sitting on a complete power, a powder keg and all different crises strategically right now could be the trigger of a thermonuclear war. There are many people, or not many, but at least some people who have said, military experts primarily, that we are now in a situation which is more dangerous than during the height of the Cold War, and that was naturally the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, after that war danger has been present for a variety of reasons for a long time, only in the last days, all of a sudden, people speak about it. Steinmeier, he says, uh, he talks about the NATO maneuvers uh, in the Baltics as war cries and sable rattling. Uh, Wolfgang Ischinger, head of the Munich Security Conference and a staunch Atlanticist, says there is the danger of an escalation into a military confrontation. NATO must tame itself. NATO must tame itself. Uh, Gernot Erler, uh, NATO is escalating uh, the situation up to a war. It should stop. Professor Stephen Cohen from New York, the United States is the biggest threat to the world uh, and if the Obama administration would do what the 51 dissenters who just open, uh, published an open letter to Obama uh, would be acted on, namely to topple Assad, within a short period of time, ISIS would sit in Damascus and U the US would be involved in a war with Syria, Iran, and Russia. Then you have between now and July uh, and the NATO summit in Warsaw, five NATO maneuvers at the Russian border in Poland, in the Baltic countries, involving between 50 to 60,000 troops. Simultaneously, the United States is moving carrier strike groups into the Mediterranean, warships of the Aegis class into the Black Sea, other US warships in the uh, Baltic Sea. Four battalions uh, will be put up after the Warsaw summit uh, in, uh, in the Baltic countries. Uh, there is a full arms race going on, modernization of all nuclear arms arsenals on both sides. The same dynamic with different predicates is essentially happen happening around the South China Sea between the United States and China. There was no problem in the South China Sea uh, until the government of the Philippines in a complete violation of international law pushed by the United States, that is the previous government, uh, went and put the territorial dispute to the court of arbitration in Den Haag. Uh, the United States, under the pretext of the freedom of nav navigation of the seas operation, uh, is now continuously violating the 12-mile zone, having overflights over Chinese islands and reefs, and the propaganda line for both the conflict with Russia and China is that Russia occupied uh, illegally Crimea and that China is involved in aggressive land grabbing in the South China Sea. And that all the moves by the United States and NATO are only in response to the aggressive behavior of Russia and China. That is a complete lie. The question to start from is how comes that 71 years after World War II, where a world in ruins made a solemn commitment, never again, never again genocide, never again war, how comes that 25 years after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, that we are now at the verge of World War III? 
there are new transcripts now available which show very clearly that in the period between 1989 and 91, there was a series of meetings where the United States gave the complete promise to the Soviet Union to not expand to the borders of Russia. On the 9th of February, then Secretary of State, of, uh, Secretary of State James Baker said that if Germany will be unified as part of the West and join NATO, then the United States will give, quote, an ironclad guarantee that NATO will not expand uh, one inch eastward. This was the key element why Soviet President Gorbachev agreed to the unification talks. Sure, there was no formal deal made, but there are many time historical witnesses, like the former ambassador to, Wash uh, to Moscow, Matlock, and others, who say that Baker gave a promise on the 18th of May 1990 that the United States will cooperate with the Soviet Union for the development of a new Europe. In June 1990, Bush promised Soviet leaders the US will work on an inclusive Europe. Now it is clear that at the same time when these promises were given, uh, the neocons in the United States worked on the PNEC project, the Project for a New American Century uh, Doctrine, which said the United States now, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, will insist on a unipolar world. We will not allow that any one nation or a group of nations ever will bypass the power economically or politically of the United States. Now, already in the mid of the 90s, East European countries, former members of the Warsaw Pact, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, the Baltics and others, were ushered into NATO. Yeltsin, Medvedev, and Gorbachev protested against this both privately and publicly, and <coughs> the United States violated the non-expansion uh, and no eastward-going uh, agreements uh, with uh, Russia. They went for a regime change. Victoria Nuland uh, admitted publicly that they spent five billion dollars on color revolution in Ukraine alone. And Helmut Schmidt, the late uh, Chancellor of Germany, uh, said that the Ukraine crisis started with the EU Maastricht Agreement because that was the moment when the EU turned into an empire with the idea to, uh, to uh, endlessly uh, gain new members. And that EU eastward expansion occurred in parallel with NATO eastward expansion. Now, what triggered the Ukraine crisis, and therefore the crisis with Russia, which already you know, was in process before, but what formally triggered it, was when at the Vilnius EU summit uh, <coughs> in late 2013, uh, they wanted to establish the Eastern Partnership uh, Project and uh, associate the uh, Ukraine with the <coughs> EU. Now, in the last moment, Yanukovych recognized that that would have given NATO access to the Ukraine and opened Russia for all U European Union products, which would have been ruinous for, for the Russian economy. So he uh, opted out in the last moment, and then you had the uh, activation of the NGOs financed by the State Department. You had the Nazis in the tradition of uh, Stepan, uh, <coughs> Bandera, uh, then this led to the coup on the 22nd of February 2014 and the referendum in the Crimea. It was not an ex annexation by Russia, it was a referendum by the majority of the people of Crimea occurred in reaction to the fascist coup uh, in Kiev. And <coughs> that record has to be set straight because unless we look at that chronology, we will be entrapped into the war propaganda uh, leading uh, to World War III. Now, in the meantime, since uh, quite some years, the NATO doctrine changed from mutual assured destruction, which was the idea that nobody could use nuclear weapons because it would lead to the annihilation of mankind. That was changed into the 
utopian conception of a winnable, limited nuclear war. That is the basis for the NATO prompt global strike. This is the logic behind the establishment of the American ballistic missile system uh, worldwide. Uh, and that that system has not the function to combat Iranian missiles should have been clear after the successful P5 plus 1 agreement with Iran. And that idea of a winnable first strike is also the logic between air -sea battle, uh, the air-sea battle doctrine against China. The same Obama who has promised uh, in 2009 that he would work to get a nuclear-free world has committed one trillion dollar for the modernization of all nuclear arsenals, uh, like the B-6112, of which there are probably 200 stationed in European countries. Uh, the, the idea is that these modernized tactical nuclear weapons are more usable because you can put them on stealth bombers and break through the air defense of your opponent. Uh, so is, uh, that's the case with the <coughs> long-range standoff weapon, the LRSW, who according to Senator Feinstein and Under Secretary for Arms Control and International Security, Ellen Toucher, uh, and their open letter in the New York Times of several weeks ago, uh, these weapon systems, they say, should not be built because they greatly increase the danger of nuclear war by blurring the line between conventional and nuclear weapons. The whole idea at this time in age to build new nuclear weapons is unnecessary, costly, and dangerous, they say. And I would say it is criminal because it's part of preparing a war of aggression, which in the Nuremberg Tribunal was uh, declared uh, to be a highest crime against humanity. Now that's the situation, and the thing which drives me absolutely crazy is that you have a situation which is more dangerous than during the Cold War Cuban Missile Crisis for a variety of reasons, because it involves thermonuclear weapons, the code of behavior in NATO, between NATO and the East has broken down, there is no red telephone between Obama and, and Putin. So despite that, the public is sleeping. The people are sleepwalking again into World War like they did in World War II. And one of the purposes of this conference is to change that and get a public debate that we do not want to be part of this. And that is why I have called, uh, and our colleagues in other countries have called, that now is the time to leave NATO. I have not done that in the past despite criticism. But when you have a clear danger that an, a continuation of this policy pursued by NATO right now could lead to the extinction of mankind, I think it is only possible to give one answer. Get out of an organization which is involved in the criminal preparation of world war. Well, there is a second existential crisis, which we all know, the immediate possibility of a crash of the transatlantic financial system. Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and others are involved in the same procedures like in 2008 by giving subprime mortgage credits. Uh, the too big to fail banks have all gigantic bubbles in the shale and oil gas. Uh, they have bubbles in other areas, cars. Uh, the only difference to 2008 is that all the instruments of the central bank have been used up, uh, lowering interest rate, well, you can make it even lower than negative interest rate, uh, you can uh, make people pay 10% to even enter their money into the banks, which is almost what is happening, so Commerzbank and, and many businesses do not put their money anymore in banks, but they keep it either under their mattress or in their safe or wherever. But that together with the idea of printing helicopter money and the fact that now in response to the Brexit crisis, uh, the Federal Reserve, the EZB, 
and the <coughs> uh, Bank of England are working 24 hours around the clock to decide how much helicopter money they have to print to prevent a collapse of the system. So that is just the end of it, and we have to really come to grips that this system is absolutely finished. Now, that, as I said, is no reason to be despaired because the Brexit opens the chance to join a completely new strategic system. The Schiller Institute campaigned since 2013 when President Xi Jinping announced the new Silk Road uh, that that approach must become a global program of reconstruction of the world economy and we published a study called the new Silk Road must become the world land bridge. Now if you look what happened with the announcement of the new Silk Road, in less than three years, this new system has developed an enormous dynamic. Already now, 70 countries are participating with the AIIB, which is a banking system associated with the new Silk Road. By the end of the year, it is expected that 100 countries will join this new system 18 countries are already part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which overlaps uh, the BRICS and the Silk Road. There are new banking systems, the AIIB, the New Development Bank, the Shanghai Cooperation Bank, the <coughs> Maritime Silk Road Fund, the Silk Road Fund, the SARC Bank, that's the bank for the South Asian countries. And, you know, the Silk Road is progressing quickly. There are presently seven to eight new train connections between China and Europe, from Chengdu, Xi'an, Chongqing, Yiwu, Lian Yungang, to such places like Madrid, Lyon, Herne, Duisburg, Hamburg, Rotterdam, and, you know, it is growing. President Xi Jinping was in the Czech Republic, in Poland, in Serbia, in Germany and France, and everywhere the idea of a cooperation of China this new Silk Road with these countries uh, became a powerful dynamic. The president of Switzerland went to China. Austria wants to become a hub of the new Silk Road. Uh, Greece uh, is joining uh, the maritime Silk Road. China is building the port of Piraeus. Now China is building a train connection between Budapest and Bucharest, which eventually will line up with the uh, Piraeus uh, Maritime Silk Road by bringing more goods uh, this way. President Mukashi of India was in China and spoke very, very uh, <coughs> bravely about the Indian-China strategic partnership. So all this talk about big tensions between India and China, forget it, it's all Western propaganda. President Xi Jinping was in Iran uh, and there they agreed that the Silk Road will be built from China to Iran. Shortly thereafter, uh, Prime Minister Modi was in Iran together with the uh, president of Afghanistan, Ghani, and they discussed that, China, that they are not only building the port of Shahabar, uh, which will be a crucial piece uh, of the Silk Road eventually going to India, but that also Afghanistan wants to be the hub for the building of the Silk Road between China and Europe, and that that way Afghanistan will be reconstructed. Xi Jinping offered already uh, 2013 all countries of the world to join in a win-win cooperation. President Putin has offered many times the integration of Europe from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from Vladivostok uh, to uh, to, the Atla uh, to, to Lisbon. Okay, so how do we look at this situation and how do we come forward? What spirit and historical precedent is necessary to make it possible that European nations enter the alliance with the Eurasian Economic Union and the One Road, One Belt policy uh, and enter a new geometry? Well, first of all, we have to start with the realization that the EU, as it developed from the Adenauer-De Gaulle conception as a political union of nation states, 
and as it was expressed in the original LEC treaty between Adenauer and de Gaulle, which unfortunately was then modified with a preamble, uh, <clears throat> that that modified EU led directly to the Maastricht Lisbon uh, EU, that that model is over. It has failed and already looking at the disgusting behavior of the Troika against Greece and other European uh, uh, countries of the South, but especially if you look at how this EU dealt with the refugee crisis, uh, you can see the complete moral collapse of Brussels. There is no more Schengen, it's over. If you have barbed wires and uh, around the borders of the Balkan countries, there is no more open traveling within Europe. There is no unity in the European Union, no solidarity and no solutions and no visions. The deal with Erdogan uh, to give this guy who is financing ISIS to the present day six billion dollars so that he keeps people in camps to prevent them uh, and no guarantee for the rights of these refugees is absolutely uh, disgusting and a violation of human rights. The Doctors Without Borders The Doctors Without Borders uh, were absolutely correct that they are refusing now to accept any money from the EU because of this behavior. The emergence of right-wing populists to outright fascist organizations in Europe is the result of the failure of the European elites and the submitting uh, under the EU, EU, EU dicta dictatorship. Now, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, uh, who is a MI5 mouthpiece in uh, the Daily Telegraph, wrote a while ago that this EU of Brussels is exactly carrying out British policy. And what we are looking at with the EU is what Churchill always wanted. He's, he wanted a united Europe, but one where the British would stay outside to be able to manipulate it uh, from the outside and then run the world on the basis of the special relationship between the Anglo-Americans. Now, in the summer 1962, after Adenauer went to France and after the fantastic journey of de Gaulle to Germany, where he was greeted uh, with absolute love and admiration, they proposed a union without Great Britain. De Gaulle at that point asked Adenauer, are you prepared to work with France if need be only our two countries? And Adenauer answered with a clear yes. The union uh, was the real goal of the Elysee Treaty of the 22nd January 1963 and before the Fouché plan. Uh, but unfortunately, de Gaulle and Adenauer lost the fight with the Atlanticists in the German Bundestag and the Gaullists were <coughs> uh, overvoted. Adenauer at that time was already weakened because Ludwig Erhard was already the assigned successor. Then on the 16th of May 1963, a preamble was forced through uh, which had the following elements a close partnership with the United States, a common defense in NATO, Great Britain joining the European Economic Commission, a free trade agreement got. So the Atlanticist won, and that was the lost chance of Europe leading to the present crisis. Now it led to a very uh, rocky road, uh, but uh, <coughs> You know, it is very clear that Europe must find some form of working together. Um, and obviously, um, the city of London and Wall Street, uh, <coughs> which is, has always been a British dépendance, they are deadly opposed against such a solution. There was a very interesting article by the former Minister of Education of Brandt in the period between 72 and 74, Klaus von Donani, uh, on the 17th June in FAZ, where he talked about uh, exactly this uh, <coughs> Adenauer-de Gaulle cooperation. 
uh, and the fact that the original economic, European economic community was uh, without Great Britain, no clear integration into NATO structures, uh, nor uh, basically having the European Commission or the European Parliament any real responsibility. It was the idea of a European fatherland of fatherlands. Uh, it was Germany, uh, France, Italy, and Luxembourg. And uh, basically, uh, de Gaulle wanted this European political union of sovereign states. And he was concerned uh, that in any case, if it would come to a serious crisis, the United States in Europe would only pursue their own interest. Now, Klaus von Donani writes in this paper that he, as the leader of a NATO exercise, had the experience that when the first Soviet invasion occurred into German territory, the United States, without previous announcement, used tactical nuclear weapons uh, on German territory. And that, by the way, was the situation in the entire Cold War period. And everybody who studied the matter uh, knows that. So that is essentially uh, the situation uh, today as well. But already in 1950, Adenauer said in a famous interview with Kinsbury Smith, a union between Germany and France uh, should be given, uh, would give seriously new life and a f powerful fresh impetus to the European idea. Now, Donani says that even Helmut Schmidt, who supported uh, the preamble in the beginning, recognized in 1983 that it was a big mistake. And that without the alliance of Germany and France, there can be no progress in Europe. So can the German government, in light of the totally muddled situation, undertake such an initiative today? And Donani says, yes, but the debate must come from the ranks and files of the society and the party, the German-French alliance remains Europe's fate and the only way to overcome the pessimistic mood in Europe, uh, we have to go back to the two most courageous men after 45, de Gaulle and Adenauer. Now, it is maybe a coincidence, but Steinmeier invited the six founding, mem founding members to a summit in Berlin uh, Germany is there already, France, Italy, the Benelux countries, and you know they say it was already planned since a long time, but I think this is very interesting. Now, having this historical reference in mind, let's look at the epistemological basis for a new paradigm. How can we get society to join the common aims of mankind and to agree to overcome geopolitics and join a global development partnership. Well, who is right? Is it those people who say that, you know, geopolitical conflict must always be, chauvinism against other countries are okay, xenophobia against other nations, even hatred against, against other ethnic groups? Well, I tell you, it's a question of the problem that these people are thinking on a low level, namely the level of sense perception or Aristotelian logic and contradictions. In order to save mankind, we need a completely different level of thinking. And I would like for this purpose to turn to Nicolas of Cusa, who was probably the most passionate proponent of an understanding among people as an expression of the relation between the one and the many, where he developed a revolutionary new method of thinking which he called the coincidentia oppositorum. For Nicolaus of Kuhs, nations characterized by their languages have natural and inalienable rights because they are legitimate as nations, but they are united through what he called the spiritus universorum, the universal spirit, which he discusses in the Docta Ignorantia about learned ignorance, which is efficient in the entire universe. Nations are expressions of diversity and specificity, but their unity exists before their di diversity. This you find also in Confucius, who says, there is unity in diversity. Nicolaus says, the whole universe 
precedes all other things as that which coincides the most perfectly corresponding to the order of nature, so that each participates in everything. Quod libet in quo libet. This means concretely that each nation can be integrated into a higher inclusive order without losing its characteristics, or that because the unity pre-exists already before the multitude. It is for Nicolaus the one humanity of which all national expressions are of a lower significance. In the famous sermon 2004, he says, the light-skinned German and the dark-skinned Ethiopian are equally human beings. It is not that Nicholas would have not known other nations because he traveled through almost every European nation. He traveled to Constantinople. But when the Mohammed II took over Constantinople in 1953, and this was what people assumed, uh, experienced as a tremendous clash of civilization, he, in response to that, answered with the beautiful ecumenical dialogue, De Pace Fide, about peace in religion, where the essential idea is that all uh, religious leaders and all philosophers of all nations can agree that there is only one truth, one God, one religion, or as Confucius would say, one harmony. Concordance is the highest form of truth, Nicolaus says in the Concordancia Catholica. There is an understanding between different nations and religion possible because they all can produce universal discoveries which can be replicated and recognized by all others. In the layman, on the experiment with a scale, he says, all discoveries made by one country must be made internationally available immediately so that they can, that all others can access what is still hidden uh, more uh, right now. Now, what Nicolaus did was to consciously break with the axioms and the popular beliefs of the Middle Ages, of what was taught in the universities and educated elites, which was scholasticism, and peripatetic, peripatetics, people believing only in logic and contradictions. Nicolaus regarded the level of the senses and understanding only as tools to put things in array. But on that level, nothing new will ever be created. The creation of the new can only occur on the level of reason, by thinking from above thinking from a higher level where the contradictions of the lower level are resolved. In the human intellect lies an indestructible prior knowledge. Because if we did not have that, he says, we would never even try to search for something. And if we found something, we would not know what, that what we found is what we sought. Because without that prior knowledge, we would not uh, result uh, this prior knowledge is not the result of deduction, uh, but it is really a form of intuition, of prescience, and it leads to the creativity of discovery of true universal principles in science and classical art. Now, all human beings have a natural condition, a metal for humanity. And in most cultures, there are teachings how to reach that level of creativity and reason, and how to overcome the barbarism of uneducated emotions and uh, logical thinking. In Confucius, uh, there is a demand for eternal learning and self-perfection. Each human being should have the aspiration to become a Hunzi, a noble person devoted to the common good. In European humanism, Schiller, in my view, has the deepest and most inspiring program for the perfection of mankind through aesthetical education. He wants to educate the emotions up to the level of reason so that each person eventually can become a beautiful soul for whom freedom and necessity, duty and passion are the same thing. For Schiller, universal history encompasses all humanity. The torch of culture and qualitative advancement 
sometimes is carried by this nation, then by that culture. But they all have the potential for development to reach a general world citizen-like condition, where in all uh, original potentials of the human species will be developed. Schiller says, the barriers will be broken through which separates states and nations through hostile egoism. All thinking minds are now united in a world, uh, world citizen-like band, and all the light of the century will now shine on a new Galileo and a new Erasmus. And I think mankind is exactly at that point. We are at the beginning of a new era which is already within reach and which will be accessible if we act in the right way. Mankind can reach what Kraft Erike called uh, the extraterrestrial imperative, meaning man can become adult. Kraft Erike, the German rocket scientist, had a beautiful vision about how space colonization would be the next natural phase of the evolution in the universe. He developed very beautifully how the evolution occurred over longer spans, how the development of life from the oceans occurred to land, how with the help of photosynthesis plant life occurred on the earth, how from amphibians and reptiles the evolution jumped to mammals and finally to human beings, how human beings first were living at the oceans and the rivers, then through infrastructure opened the landlocked areas of the planet, and how now the new Silk Road becoming the world land bridge will complete that phase of the evolution by opening up all landlocked areas uh, of the world. And Kraft Erika also said that joint international space research and travel is the next necessary phase of the evolution of mankind in the universe. That mankind will become a space-based species. So I think we, are, we should be fully conscious that in this present crisis lies a tremendous chance to reach a new renaissance as significant and maybe even more significant than the change from the Middle Age to the modern times that if we break with the axioms of you know, the globalization, of the deductive thinking, of all the things which have led to this crisis, and focus on the creativity of mankind as that which distinguishes us from other species, that we can live to see, many of us probably can live to see, a world where each child is educated universally, and that the normal condition of mankind will be genius. That that which is human, to be fully developed, to, to have all the potentials developed of the human species as creative composers, scientists, engineers, extraordinary uh, people discovering things which we don't even know the question thereof. Like China going to the far side of the moon. We will understand secrets of the universe which we don't even know yet uh, to, to, to ask. And people will become better people. I believe that the true nature of human beings is good. That every human being has a capacity for limitless self-perfection and goodness of the soul. And to accomplish that is within reach. And let's work for it. <laughs>